What is up guys, Karma Medic here and welcome back to another dose. In today's video, I'm going to be tackling the decision making questions on the UCAT exam. Hopefully you guys have been enjoying the other videos I've been posting about the UCAT test. You can find those on my channel and I'll leave links in the description as well. I've got my pink hoodie on today, I'm trying to switch it up with the hoodies that I'm wearing. If you don't know who I am, my name is Nasser. I'm a second year medical student at King's College London and I make a bunch of videos about my life at medical school. But one of my main goals with this channel is to also help other people get into medical school. So that's what this UCAT series is about. Anyway, today I'm doing decision making as you've seen in the title. Decision making, it's sort of the logic processing part of the UCAT exam. It's where you have to make logical deductions, you have to follow logic through a paragraph or through a series of information, and then you have to evaluate answers based on those statements that were given to you before. If you guys are looking for specific tips on the decision making section, I would link you back to the video that I posted last summer. But for this video today, what I'm going to do is focus on answering the decision making questions live on camera. Shout out to Medify for partnering with me on this video. They're an online UCAT question bank, which I'm sure you've heard of before. And if you haven't, you should check out the links in the description below. They're actually the reason that I know how to tackle the decision making section. I never had decision making on the UCAT tests that I wrote because I wrote them back in 2013 and 2017. So last year over the summer, I used Medify to teach myself how to do the decision making section and then practice those questions to be able to make these videos for you guys. If you guys want, pause the video, try and work out the question for yourself, see what answer you come to. And then when I answer it, we can see if our answers match or if they're different. And if you disagree with me, you can find me in the comments down below and I'll be sure to get back to you on there. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump straight into doing the questions live on camera. So as you can see here, decision making, it's split into drawing conclusions and evaluating arguments. I'm gonna do the general decision making sections that I get a mix of both of those questions and we can tackle them. Wow, there's 813 questions. I guess let's get started. All right, right off the bat, first question, there's a Venn diagram. Um, I just remembered that from last year, these Venn diagrams come up quite often. So make sure you revise how Venn diagrams work, what the different sections mean that are highlighted together, etc, etc. So I'm going to whip out my iPad so I can write a couple of things down. That's also quite important in the decision making section I found. The diagram shows the symptoms of some patients in a waiting room at a GP. The rectangle represents patients with a sore throat. Okay. The cross represents X, Y, and Z. So look, there's a lot of information here. And if I'm going to read through this paragraph and say the cross represents this, the triangle represents that, it's going to take a lot of time. So I'm going to jump straight to the answers, read them one by one and try and knock them out or choose the correct one. And I think that would be a faster and more efficient way to tackle a question like this that has a lot of information and is complicated. So let's start with the, with the statements here. 21 patients presented with a cough, sore throat and fatigue. So cough is the cross. Sore throat is the rectangle um, and fatigue is the square. So cross, rectangle and fatigue is this crossover point here, which as you can see is 13, not 21, so A is wrong. The most common symptom is a cough. Cough is the cross and there are 14 plus 21 plus 13 people that have a cough. So that adds up to what? 21. 25, 35, 38, 48. So 48 people had a cough, which if I look at this, seems like it could be the highest, but the rectangle has a lot too. So let me count the rectangle. Um, 21, 32, 45, and the rectangle already has more. So I know that that's incorrect as well. 75% of patients presenting with fatigue also present with another symptom. So fatigue is the square and 75% of them present with another symptom. So these three need to be 75% of the total, if this is correct. So 13 plus 11 is 24, plus six is 30. So 30 out of a total of 40 is 75% are presenting with another symptom. So C is correct. Once I know that C is correct, I don't need to check D. It's an answer that I don't need to evaluate. And with these questions, because you're constrained for time, once you know your answer, once you think you have it, move on because each question is worth one mark. They're all worth the same amount of marks. So you want to make sure you do as many questions as you can and get right as many questions as you can. One question correct. Boom, 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 boom. Off to a great start. All right, next question. Should the government subsidize fruit and vegetables to reduce obesity in the general population? Select the argument which is the strongest. Okay, so for these types of questions, don't use your own personal opinions, don't use your own preconceived notions or ideas or whatever in order to answer these questions. Whether the answer ends up being yes, blah, 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 or no, blah, 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 doesn't matter at all. And it doesn't matter if you agree with it or not, okay? 
the only thing that we're trying to decide is which one of these answers is the strongest argument. So before I even look at the arguments, you know that the strongest argument is going to have to talk about both fruits and vegetables, and it's going to have to mention obesity and probably in the general population as opposed to other populations. That's going to be the strongest argument. So let's evaluate them one by one. Yes, fruit and vegetables are too expensive for many people to afford. Okay, it's not great. Yes, when government subsidizes subsidies of this nature were introduced, obesity rates fell. Should the government subsidize to reduce obesity? So this is showing evidence from the past that when something like this has happened before, it did lead to the outcome that we wanted, which is a reduction in obesity. So that's very good. No, 63% of people would choose fast food over fruit and vegetables, even if they were the same price. That's a decent argument, but it still leaves the other percentage of people that would choose fruit and vegetables if they were subsidized. No, even fruit and vegetables could be unhealthy if consumed in excess. I mean, this may be true, but it doesn't tackle the issue of uh, reducing obesity or government subsidies. So I'm going to go with the second one because it tackles all the different parts of the statement that we talked about here and it gives evidence um, to show that this is correct. A very important thing for these types of questions is you want to look for answers that give evidence. Anytime that you show evidence, that's going to be very, very good in giving a strong argument. So let's see here. This is the strongest argument as it's the only argument to directly link both sides of the argument. So both government subsidies and obesity. Furthermore, uh, suggests that this argument is based on evidence. So evidence is good. Next question. Ooh, we have a graph. Number of shelters, magnitude of the earthquake, uh, bars, circles, okay. I'm not gonna spend forever looking at this paragraph unless I'm told to by the answers. I'm gonna quickly jump to the answers and try and work out from the graph. Because if you look at this graph and try and break it down and understand it and read everything that's going on, you're gonna waste so much time. Go straight to the answers, read the questions and see if you can answer them. So these questions have five different answers or questions per statement or paragraph. The UCAT hasn't told anyone how these are marked, whether if you get three out of five or four out of five or five out of five, you get the one mark because this entire question is worth one mark. They haven't told us how it's marked, um, but of course you want to answer as many as you can correct. There were enough shelters in April. Number of shelters, magnitude of earthquake. This doesn't tell me about enough. So I'm gonna to move to the paragraph. Adequate emergency shelters, a minimum of 10 shelters per 20,000 people was set as the baseline. Okay, so in April, I need 10 shelters per 20,000 people. So number of shelters is 125. Oh no, I was looking in the wrong line. Ah! February had the most casualties. Number of shelters, magnitude of earthquake. Um, does it say that magnitude is related to casualties anywhere? This graph doesn't tell us anything about the number of casualties, okay? So the conclusion does not follow. We have nothing from this paragraph or from this graph to base the number of casualties in relation to the magnitude of earthquakes or in relation to the number of shelters, which is the information that we're given. So we cannot, um, we cannot do that. The earthquake in February destroyed existing shelters available in January. Again, we don't know that. Um, it could be the case that some shelters were taken down. It could be the case that some shelters were moved to outside of this region. We don't know that it's the, the earthquake in January that led to this decrease in the number of shelters. So the conclusion does not follow. The least number of shelters, the least number of shelters were available in the month with the largest magnitude earthquake. The largest magnitude earthquake was in February, which did not have the least number of shelters because March had the least number of shelters. So this is a no. The number of available shelters gradually increased after March. So March, increase, increase, increase. So that conclusion does follow. Hoping for that four out of five, five out of five vibe. That's what I'm hoping for. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Partially correct, okay. How many did I get right? Four out of five, okay. Um, should more roads be built to overcome the issue of traffic congestion on main roads? Yes, if more roads are built, commuters will spend less time driving. Okay, fine, but it doesn't really tell me about traffic congestion on main roads. Yes, building more roads will offer drivers other options to get to their destination. Okay, so that suggests that other options away from the main roads, so pretty good. No, building more roads will endanger the green belt around our cities. This is the first time we've heard of the green belt, so it's gonna be a no. No, as it is not guaranteed that building more roads will stop drivers from using the high street. Again, kind of irrelevant to the statement here. So which of these two is better? Yes, if more roads are built, commuters will spend less time driving. Fine, this, this talks about time, not traffic congestion. Um, so, I mean, although probably good argument, it's not the strongest, I don't think. Building more roads will offer drivers other options to get to their destination. 
I think that's the correct answer. And that's correct. Boom, boom, boom. Next question. Should we reintroduce the death penalty for serious crimes in order to prevent them from happening in the first place? Okay, select the strongest argument from the statements below. No, the death penalty is against the basic human right to life and thus should not be implemented even for the most serious of crimes. This sounds like an opinion, not based on any evidence about reducing the amount of crimes that happen in the first place. And what I'm looking for is evidence, not personal opinions. No other countries that use the death penalty have seen the same proportion of serious crimes, which shows that criminals are not deterred by the fact that they might be sentenced to death. That is a very strong argument. It's showing an example of previous evidence where this type of implementation has happened before and has not led to a decrease in crime rates. It's a very good argument. Let me quickly read the other two. Yes, death penalty is a very effective humane method of killing, again, an opinion. Um, who will probably never be released opinion. Yes, the amount of money that could be saved by sentencing very troubled criminals to death justifies reintroducing as penalty. This is talking about something else, which is saving money, which has nothing to do with the statement uh, that's given to us. So I'm gonna choose B, pretty sure it's the right answer. In fact, I'm willing to bet my YouTube channel on it. Anyone take the bet? Anyone take the bet? A. Hey, if you took the bet, not this time, maybe next time, maybe next time. All right, next question. All cereal brands are produced in the same cereal factory. All cereals contain chocolate, except the brand Chocolates, which does not contain chocolate. Several cereal brands produced in this factory contain fruit. Okay, so let's evaluate these conclusions. Some cereals contain both chocolate and fruit. If all cereal brands are produced in the same cereal factory and some of them or several of them have fruit and all of them contain chocolate, then that means that some of them will have both chocolate and fruit. Does that make sense? All cereals are made in the factory all of the cereals made in the factory have chocolate, except for this one brand, and several brands, so more than one, have fruit. So even if that one brand that doesn't have chocolate didn't have fruit, other ones, because it says several, will have fruit. So at least one brand will have some cereals with both chocolate and fruit. There is fruit in chocolate cereal. We can't know that for sure. It could be the case, but we don't know for sure. Yeah, because it says all cereals contain chocolate except chocolate. So we know chocolate doesn't have chocolate and it says several have fruit. So it could have fruit, it could not have fruit. We don't know, but this statement says for certain it has fruit. So the conclusion does not follow. If a cereal is selected at random and is found to not contain chocolate, then it must be a chocolate cereal. This is correct because all cereals contain chocolate except that one chocolate. If two cereal brands are selected randomly from the factory and both of them contain fruit, then one of them must be a chocolate cereal. If two brands are selected randomly and both contain fruit, several cereal brands contain fruit, then one of them must be chocolate. Why? No, you could still choose two cereal brands that have fruit and it could be that you chose two that are not the chocolate brand. I'm gonna go with no. If a cereal does not contain chocolate, then it must contain fruit. If a cereal does not contain chocolate, so it's chocolate, then it must contain fruit. No, several cereal brands contain fruit. It doesn't say all of them, several of them. So some of them could not contain fruit and it could be the ones that are also chocolate. So I'm gonna go with no. All right, so quick note on this type of thinking and these types of questions. This kind of logic, this kind of thinking is something that's used all the time in medical school. If you're looking at uh, radiographs, you're looking at patient notes, you're looking at blood tests and taking pieces of information from each of those things, you have to sort of eliminate what potential or differential diagnoses the patient might have. So that's why this type of thinking is important. That's why they're testing it on the UCAT. Don't think that you're doing this for nothing. It is useful to get good at those questions. Another Venn diagram question, our favorite here on YouTube. A store recorded the number of types of microwave meals they've told to customer. Customer more, one, I told myself I didn't want to read the paragraph. Moving on to the questions. Based on the diagram, how many customers ordered pasta, risotto, and lemon pudding, but not cottage pie or quiche? Jesus, all right, one step at a time. How many ordered pasta? Pasta is this strange shape here. Oh, it's the big one, fine. Pasta and risotto, so pasta and risotto, so it's everything in here. Mm-hmm. Pasta and risotto and lemon pudding, so lemon pudding is that shape there, which is only here. Okay, nice, we're down to seven but not cottage pie or quiche. Cottage pie is the circle, which is outside of this area, and quiche is the triangle, which is also outside of this area, so it's seven. It's this little square right here. Did you guys follow that? So we started with pasta, this big square rectangle thing here, 
And then we went to risotto, which was this pentagon within the pasta thing. And then we went on to this parallelogram that was within the square, within the pentagon. So only seven. Let's go. Next meme, another Venn diagram. Based on, I'm gonna jump straight to the question. Based on the diagram, how many employees in company X do not know how to code in C? Company X is this dotted line here and coding in C is this. So eight plus 11 people do know how to code in C, which means that six plus 13 plus two do not. So that's eight plus 13, which is 21. And that will be our answer. If I'm going too fast or it's not making enough sense, do let me know in a comment down below and I'll be sure to tackle that in upcoming videos. We have another Venn diagram question. I'm just gonna jump straight to the question. How many schools organize a 10,000 meter race, javelin and high jump event, but not a diving or a 100 meter sprint? Okay, similar to thinking to what we had before. Let's start big and move small. So 10,000 meter race is this strange shape here, which is this here, and a javelin, which is the heart. So now we're just down to eight and nine, and a high jump event, which is this lightning bolt. So now we're only down to nine, but not a diving, which is that big thing up there, so it's not important to us, or in a 100 meter sprint, which is the arrow, which is also outside of this nine, so the answer is nine. Next question involves a graph. Um, just a quick browse here, because it's a short paragraph. Television in thousands for a year, two tournaments, different months, views increase. Okay, there was a tournament during April to June. April to June, views increased, okay. Uh, both UK and US viewings increased during the tournament season, so then yes. The US qualified to the end of the world tournament. Um, US views, I mean, I don't think there's any way for us to know that. Both UK and US views increased during the tournament season. We don't even know when the end of the tournament is, um, so we don't have enough information to follow that conclusion. The summer tournament had the most views. I think that is pretty clear to say. Total views in the summer here, winter views there. So we can say that. There was a tournament in the UK in November. Yes, because it says both UK and US viewings increased during the tournament season, and we can see an increase in views during the tournament season, so that's a yes. The UK is more interested in football than the US. UK um, and US. So UK is generally above the US most of the time. Um, can we conclude that therefore the UK is more interested in football than the US? Yes, they have more views, but does that mean that they're more interested? I don't know. And uh, I think this could be a yes or a no. I'm going to go with no, um, because there could be more viewings for other reasons. I, it does, it does follow logical sense in my head that that would be the case, but because I'm only using information from the passage, I'm going to go with no, but I acknowledge that it could be yes. So one partially correct, I'm going to assume it's that last one. Oh no, I was right there. Okay, let's see what I got wrong. There was a tournament in the UK in November. The text mentions that during the tournament, both UK and US viewings increased. The diagram shows that only UK viewings increased while US viewings clearly decreased. <laughs> Whoops, yeah. They're right, absolutely. Uh, UK and US viewings increased during tournament season. And over here, I incorrectly looked at this line and said, yep, they're increasing. Whereas this line is just for the UK. The US viewings actually decreased, which means that um, there was no tournament during that season. So that's my bad. So generally for these types of questions, assumptions are gonna be a no. All right, we've got another lovely Venn diagram video. Adrian's grandmother knits various items for him and his family, blah, 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 I don't care. Moving on to the questions. Based on the diagram, which of the following statements is true? 13 family members were given a bag and a scarf. Bag is a triangle, scarf is this. So let's see where those intersect. 13 family members were given a bag and a scarf. That does in fact seem correct. I'm going to choose that answer and move on with my life and move on with this test because if you find the answer that's correct, don't bother checking the other ones, choose it and move on. Boom, correct. Next question. All right, one of these complicated logic following questions. I'm gonna start at the end. Who stood at the front of the line? Okay, there are 12 inches in a foot. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know that because I only work in meters. So who stood at the front of the line? Six people line up in height order with the tallest person at the front and the smallest at the back. David is five foot eight. Correct, correct, correct. So since David is five foot eight and someone whose name begins with S is stood behind David. So we know that David can't be the last person because there's someone behind him. 
and there's no one between Sam and Samantha. So if both, if either of Sam and Samantha were behind David, then there would have to be two behind David, but we know that David is the second smallest, which means only one person can be behind David, which means that that person must be Steve. So the last two people are David and then Steve. Now, we also know that David is the second smallest and Steve is two inches shorter than David. We know that Steve is the shortest and he's two inches shorter, which means that Steve is five foot six, and there's nine inches between the tallest and the smallest. So if the shortest is five foot six, that means the tallest is six foot three because the difference is nine, which takes us from six to, from five foot six to six foot to six foot three. And we know that Dave, Daisy is six foot three and we know that the tallest person is six foot three. Therefore, the person at the front of the line who is the tallest must be Daisy. A group of children, A, T, M, and S like eating a wide variety of desserts. Aiden only eats the same desserts as Manisha. So I'm just gonna write down A equals M just to help myself keep track. Sarah likes to eat cake and ice cream. So S, R, O, C, S, R, O, I, C for cake and ice cream. Tyler only eats chocolate flavored desserts. Tyler, chocolate, C, H. Manisha only eats cake and never eats any other type of dessert. Manisha only cake. And since Manisha and Aiden eat the same dessert, then Aiden only eats cake as well. The only, the only eat food that they like and only like food that they eat. So they only eat food that they like and only like food that they eat. Aiden likes eating ice cream. No, because Aiden likes the same thing as Manisha and Manisha only eats cake. At least three of the children eat cake. Um, okay, so we know that Manisha and Aiden eat cake and Sarah likes to eat cake, so at least three eat cake, true. Tyler does not eat any dessert unless it's chocolate. Tyler only eats chocolate flavored desserts, so it doesn't mean that he only, wait, Tyler does not eat any dessert unless chocolate flavor. Yes, that's true, it says it right there. Manisha is the only child that eats one type of dessert. Uh, no, because Manisha and Aiden are the same and Manisha only eats cake, so both of them. Sarah likes more than one type of dessert. Sarah likes to eat cake and ice cream. True. All right, that seems simply straightforward. When things are that straightforward, it usually gets me a little bit suspicious, but nope, five out of five, we are good to go. Okay, this question looks like a horrible nightmare throwback to chemistry in high school and in university but let's take a look and see what we can do. Ratio value R is calculated to determine the strength of the solution without having to calculate the exact pH solution. Okay, fine. Time taken to dissolve over mass of magnesium. This question is gonna take a long time to answer. I would probably guess and move on and come back to it if I was doing the test, but let's see what I can do. Solution A has a pH of less than seven. The test will not work if the solution is not an acid and all acids will dissolve magnesium. Okay, so. This is true. Solution D was a mixture of a strong and weak acid. Um, a strong and weak acid. Did the magnesium dissolve? Yes. The test will not work if the solution is not an acid. Um, I'm gonna say I'm not gonna be able to conclude that. Solution E was the strongest acid. Uh, the higher the value of R, the stronger the acid. Nope, it's the other way around. The stronger the acid, the lower the pH. So the lower the value of R. Solution F is not an acid. Um, did the magnesium dissolve? No. All acids will dissolve magnesium. So it's not an acid, that's true. Whoops. Solution F is not an acid. Partially correct. Did I really get that wrong? It took the longest time for the magnesium to dissolve in solution E. The magnesium dissolves quicker in stronger acids, okay. So I assumed that the strongest acid had the lowest pH as calculated by this thing, but it does say here the magnesium dissolves quicker in stronger acids. So the quickest acid to dissolve would be the strongest one, uh, which is not E. So that's wrong. Um, but four out of five, I'll take it on these questions. Again, the UCAT has not said if three out of five or four out of five or five out of five actually ends up giving you the mark for this section. So nobody actually knows, but just do as best as you can. In a family, there are five cousins with different ages. Louis is Oral the Jude, Emily's twice Alex, Adwin is this. Oh man. All right, let's figure out a sequence of ages for these people. Lewis is older than Jude. I'm gonna put the oldest people on the left. Now, nah, I'll put the youngest people on the left and the oldest on the right. So Lewis is older than Jude. Emily is twice Alex's age. Okay, that doesn't help me yet. Adam is 10 years older than Jude. So we know Adam is after Jude, older. Jude's age is two thirds that of Alex. And Emily is twice Alex. So 
uh, Jude's age is two thirds that of Alex. So Jude is younger than Alex and Emily is older than Alex. So Jude is two thirds younger than Alex. Oh, there's Alex and Adam. Okay, so Adam is older than Jude. Jude is two thirds that of Alex. So Alex is older than Jude. And Emily is twice Alex's age. So Emily is older than Alex. The age difference between Jude and Alex is the same as the age difference between Alex and Louis. And Emily is 24. Okay, <laughs> Emily is 24. Emily is twice Alex's age. So Alex is 12. Emily is 24. Jude is two thirds of Alex. And I know that Alex is 12. So Jude must be eight. And Adam is 10 years older than Jude. So Adam is 18. The age difference between Jude and Alex, which is four, is the same as the age difference between Alex and Lewis. So Lewis must be 16. Oh God, and Emily is 24. So the third oldest, Emily is 24. Adam is 18, Lewis is 16. So I think Lewis is the third oldest. And then Alex is 12 and Jude is eight. Like so much thinking and ordering going on. Okay, so we got it right. All right, final question I'm gonna do for today. Students were asked for the universities which they had received offers from. Some students received more than one offer. Based on the diagram, how many students got an offer from Cambridge, York and Lancaster, but not Bath or Nottingham? So Cambridge, Cambridge, Cambridge is this octagon, I think here. Cambridge and York, York is this bubble, so six and nine, and Lancaster, which is this circle, so it's just that little nine, but not Bath, so not that triangle down there, and not Nottingham, so not that little diamond there, so it's just nine. All right, finishing this day on a high note, got that question right. All right guys, and that is where I'm gonna cut this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, do definitely leave a like on it. Leave me a comment down below as well, letting me know what you enjoyed, what you didn't like, and what you wanna see in the upcoming videos. Subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more UCAT content and more medical school related content from me. Follow me on Instagram if you want to as well. I post quite a few photos on there that give you a little bit more of a personal insight into my life at medical school. Anyways guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.